God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at r-a-h-a-r-d-i-n dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Here's a few tips in finding Richard's podcast. Go to the World Wide Web at k98talk.com. Scroll down to Podcasts. When Podcast comes up, look for a red button with a white plus sign in it. Open this content in a new window by clicking the link. When a new website appears, click on Shows. Then scroll to God's Pure Word of Faith. Click on the name and a list of programs will come up. That's it. Now enjoy God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rails. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome to God's Pure Word of Faith. I'm Richard Harden. I'll be with you now for the next well hour. If you'll stick around with me, I'll be glad to you know, share some things with you. And today's going to be a different type of program. Uh, most of my programs so far have been about a particular subject and you know the the understanding of that subject or whatever but today I'm going to be sharing some uh, well some things that I've heard on radio and television and different churches and I just want to share these topics with you so that uh, you can kind of see what's being taught around our society and then I'll share some of the scriptures that uh, go along with these different subjects. There'll be a lot of different subjects today. But anyway, uh, I want to share with you now about my website because on my website, uh, you know, I have a book tab, my six books, and I have a tab to 18 videos that you can go in and, you know, look at some of these different subjects that I'm going to be discussing this morning, even. And uh, I have a blog. 20-something messages that still share some information about what I'm going to be sharing this morning. So 
listen to this in and get my website uh, URL down and, and check it out sometime this week if you'd like to. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Welcome back now. Today I'm going to be sharing with you uh, a very important message about some of the topics being preached or taught around our society. And to the reason I take the time to do this is that our country is in such bad shape as far as uh, how people look at Christianity. There used to be a lot of respect in our society back in the 50s and 60s. A lot of respect, <coughs> excuse me, for Christians or for people going to church or you know, in in different religious activities and everything. But nowadays, seem to be wanting to get rid of Christians, to push Christians back out um, of the community or something, or you know, back out of sight. And I think this is because of the image that Christianity is presenting to the, well, unchristian world for the, I guess, whatever we want to consider, you know, our society, the people that aren't concerned um, and involved in our, you know, worship services and things like this. I think our Christian community is so fragmented and so uh, chopped up that there, there's so much activity going on inside of our community of discord uh, arguments back and forth that uh, well let's just take a look at it first I want to share with you though about what the Bible says that as a Christian community we should be like in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 2 through 5 the scripture says endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace there is one body it's talking about one body of Christ, one spirit, one spirit of God, one, you know, spirit of Christ, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. And this one hope of our calling, now each of us has a special holy calling, and uh, it's without a permissive will, too. It's, let's see, it's 2 Timothy 1 9, where it says that uh, God has saved us and called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace created in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now see, see, each one of us have a holy calling, and we should be seeking that. And he doesn't say that if you find it and you don't like it, that he has a permissive will that he'd like for you to do something else, and maybe if you enjoy something else better. See, no such thing as permissive will in God's mind. Now, he, he, he doesn't make us do what he wants us to do, but just because he doesn't strike us down and make us do it, that doesn't mean that it's his permissive will. He is allowing us to not serve in his holy calling, but that's not his, you know, like a will for us that, you know, he can be that pleased with us if we don't love and care for him enough to seek his holy calling. So there's one body of Christ, one spirit, even as we're called in one hope of our calling, <coughs> one Lord, one faith. Now the one faith is what I want to emphasize today. There's one faith. When we seek the Lord and, uh, we're seeking our holy calling or you know, trying to understand more about God and things like this. He wouldn't tell me one thing and then come along uh, and then tell you something else and then tell somebody else something else. Now, he will about what our holy calling is because we each have different callings. But I'm talking about beliefs of the scripture and uh, the way he wants us to live and the way he wants us to enter relate with each other and things like this and interrelate with lost people even you know, to help draw them to uh, him. Proverbs 11.30 says that the fruit of the righteous tree of life, he that winneth souls is wise. You know, he wants us to be seeking to reach out to people who aren't Christians and let him work through us to be an influence to draw them to him. And that was his will for the 
people of the Old Testament too. Um, what is it David says in Psalm 67? God be merciful and bless us and cause your face to shine upon us. You know, he's saying bless us and cause your face to shine upon us. And the very next verse says that your will may be known on earth, your saving health among all the nations. See that we can be an example for you to others. Now, if we aren't seeking together as a Christian society to become that one faith, one body of Christ, and in unity of the spirit, in unity of mind and, and spiritual belief, uh, on down in verse Ephesians 4, 11 to 14 then, Apostle Paul says, And he, God, gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, building up of the body of Christ. See, he's, he's, he's called out certain people to teach and preach and share his word with us so that we can be drawn together in the body of Christ and grow. And in verse 13 says that these people then, uh, preachers, teachers, pastors, and so on, it says, till we all, now all of us means all of us, come into a unity of the faith. See, that's one faith. And we, the, our, all of our ministers should be teaching to bring us to that point of one faith, not four or five hundred denominations and different groups like this and everything. We should be having one faith. The, the born again, you know, uh, Christians with Christ in their heart, the new heart, the new life, the changed heart, and with the Spirit of Christ in them. It says, Now, till we all come into unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of a statue of fullness of Christ. Now listen to verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sly of men and cunning craftiness. And that's what's happened is it says, henceforth be no more children. We're children, babes in Christ in our society, tossed to and fro from this denomination, that denomination, from this belief to that belief, carried about with every wind of doctrine comes along like that. So we've wound up then with three or four hundred different denominations, different groups, instead of one faith. The people in the New Testament, well, they were in one accord until the day of Pentecost. You know, they, they were in one accord, not just as they were getting along together and, you know, enjoying each other and everything. They were in one belief, one, you know, in unity of belief and everything. That's the unity that we're supposed to be having. Uh, well, like I said in Psalms 133, 1, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. But that unity is unity of belief. Okay, now, in fact, in John 17, uh, when Jesus was praying, his you know prayer before going, being taken to the cross and everything, and like this, he was praying to his Father, and he said, And all are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. This is verse 10 through 15. And I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep thou thine own name, those who have thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. See, he, he, we should be joined together in one as Jesus and his heavenly Father was. That, that same unity, one spirit, you know, and, and one belief. Uh, we should just be born again, children of God. Children of God, not just creatures or something like that still. But when his spirit comes in us, we become children of God. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, And a uh, new heart also will give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away your stony heart out of your flesh, give you heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you. See, when he puts his spirit in us, we now then are in a sense adopted from our earthly parents and fathers and everything. Now we become children of God. Join heirs with Jesus as uh, Galatians 4, 6 says, And because your sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father, wherefore thou no more a servant but a son, if a son, the heir of God through Christ. Join heir with Jesus. And it goes on to say, While I was with them more, I kept them in their name. Those that thou hast given me I have kept, and none of them are lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be full. Uh, and he goes on to pray that, you know, we, we be one in unity and everything. He shares again in uh, 1 Corinthians 1 through 4, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 through 4. Uh, now, babes in Christ and carnal, 
uh, in this particular thing. Babes in Christ means, again, like before, you know, confusion and, you know, lack of knowledge and things like this in, in the Lord. And carnal is for, you know, uh, sinful type things that Christians might be doing. Now, verse uh, one, verses 1 through 4. And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. See, they've got a lot of sinful things in the church here in Corinthians. Even as unto babes in Christ. He's saying, you're like, you're a babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able to bear it. For you are not for, let's see, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and division. Are you not carnal? Look at all the strife and division in our Christian society. And uh, back and forth. Are you not yet carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I'm a Paul, and the other says, I'm a Paulus, are you not carnal? Now see, he's talking about two divisions in the church there, and he's saying there's car they're a carnal bunch now, that they are, you know, uh, babes in Christ. What would he think if he saw our society when we have three or four hundred different denominations? And, you know, I'm Baptist, I'm Methodist, I'm Pentecostal, I'm this, I'm Nazarene, so on like this. And just go down and name it, name it. What a, you know, a split up. Christian supposedly society whereas babes in Christ is what he's saying we you know he's just telling them in one division you know between they're saying I'm a Paul and you and I'm of Apollos and that makes them babes in Christ but our society is babes in Christ for sure first Corinthians chapter 1 verses 12 13 Paul's saying now he's saying this to a very sinful church that even had uh, openly had you know what uh, sex and sexual sin going on in their church and everything. But he addresses these differences first that they're babes in Christ before he even gets to the sinful acts they're committing in the church. First Corinthians 1, 12 through 13. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of Cephas, and I am of a Christ. Is Christ divided? Yet Paul, uh, was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And he goes on and said, no. And in fact, he says, I, I, I haven't even baptized him except maybe Gaius or something like this. He only baptized just a couple of people. He said that uh, God didn't send him to baptize. He sent him to preach the gospel and help people get drawn together. But okay, this is the purpose of why, why I'm going to share these things this morning. It's because of we should be all trying to come together in one, one belief. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, it talks about us having our full armor of God. Put on our full armor of God. You know, to uh, uh, well, in, in, in verse chapter 6, verse 16, it says, and, you know, put on, you know, the shield of faith. Now, this shield of faith is to shield all the fiery darts of the wicked, it says. We have, you know, a shield of faith. That means that we've accepted God's word. We have his pure word because it's got to be pure Proverbs 35 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure. Shield them, put their trust in it. Don't add to, lest thou be reproved, and thou be made a liar, or uh, evidenced by God not backing up what you say, and your shield not, you know, quenching the fiery darts. But it says that if, if we're, we have God's pure word in our beliefs and everything, now that would bring us all together, you know, because God's going to tell us all the same thing. So we have a shield of faith. We're accepting and obeying God's word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, but only if you accept and obey his word. If you reject his word, it's what's called unbelief. Read chapter 3 of Hebrews, chapter 3, verses 12 to 19. The children of Israel failed to enter the promised land because they rejected God's will to cross over the Jordan. They were afraid of the giants, wouldn't trust God to take care of them. And it says they failed to enter in because of an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. So, when we depart from his word or you know add to his word you know it's not Christ anymore his living word is Christ when when he speaks Christ goes forth and creates okay now so we've got to have his pure word and in Psalms 138 too it says he exalts his word above all his names because he and his word are one and the same his word is him manifesting himself in our minds and hearts giving us information or giving us a instruction or something 
but we say God spoke to us or God sent his word to us, something like this. But it's God himself coming to us. He and his word are one and the same. John chapter 1, in the beginning was a word and the word was a God and the word was God and is God. You know, and just something like that. So we need to have his pure word and then we'll be growing together in faith. Now I want to read you some of these things here. If we don't have his pure word, see, uh, the devil can come in and attack us in those areas that we're, you know, standing up you know and and professing to have god's word and saying this and saying that and then uh, you know i've i've sad to say i've seen a lot of people and in the last 40 years i'm claiming my healing by faith i'm claiming my healing by faith and a couple of days later they die so so they've got this thing then well that's a perfect healing well that's not what it's talking about when you're claiming your healing by faith when it's if you're claiming you're healing by faith, that means you've heard from God, and God has said he, you're going to live. Like Second uh, Kings chapter 20, when God sent a messenger to uh, King Hezekiah and said, Set your house in order, you're going to die. Well, he turned to the Lord and talked to him. And then God sent the messenger back and said, Okay, I've seen your prayers. Uh, I've seen your tears, and I've heard your prayers. And I'm going to heal you and give you 15 more years. Now, see, that's what we mean by healing when we're praying for God to heal us and everything, that God does actually heal us answers our prayer now to get those answers I'll say we got to be praying according to God's word and his will and praying and even seeking his will if we don't know it you know like that but to be claiming and say I'm getting my healing by faith that means you've heard from God and you're just telling people God said he was going to heal me and I'm you know uh, confessing it and and you would be healed if God says he's going to heal you and you confess it, you will be healed. See, that's what it means by claiming by faith. But I've seen so many die like that. Just saying words that sound good is not getting, you know, God's pure word and getting him to back you up. Now, here's a lot of things in our society that uh, are different in the scripture as far as what people say and do and everything. Uh, Romans 12 3 it says God has dealt to every man a measure of faith many ministers around our country and everything are teaching all men have faith because of that one verse but if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 20 the first time the word faith used God says my children are so evil uh, there's no they have no faith he, God's the first one that used the word faith if you look at it in accordance it tells you you know every time the words are used in the scriptures and everything the first time God says, my children are evil, they have no faith. Mark 4.40, Jesus said when the disciples woke him up on the boat and he stood up and calmed the winds and the waves, said, peace be still. He turned to the disciples and jumped on them, didn't congratulate them for coming to him. He said, why do you have no faith? See, good people have faith in some areas and good people reject or lack faith in other areas. You know, Mike, you might have a lot of faith, you know, like for, if you know, God, uh, saving people you know you tell them about Jesus and you tell them about salvation and you know that God's going to uh, come in and forgive their sins and and you know uh, create them new heart and new life and everything but when you go over here you say well well God doesn't heal the day like that and then something else well God will provide for so so you can have faith in some areas and no faith in other areas because you aren't accepting God's living word in those areas you got to, the promises come to us through faith Jesus made provision for them on the cross just like he made provision for our forgiveness. But we've got to know the promises, accept them, and receive them in our heart for them to come alive in us for our personal walk of faith, walking daily by faith. Now, so some people are strong in some areas and weak in other areas. But then again, the Apostle Paul said in Romans 12:3, uh, all men have a measure of faith. He was talking to Christians that Romans chapter 12 is the gifts of the Spirit. And talking to Christians, all Christians do have faith. Ephesians 2 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. You gotta have faith or you wouldn't become a Christian. You wouldn't be one. But now listen to the Apostle Paul in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 2. He says, Pray for us we be delivered from evil and wicked men in whom is no faith. See, so it, he's not teaching that all men are born, babies are born with faith. Faith comes from a personal choice that you have to make. When you hear God's word, you have to make a choice to receive his word or reject it. When he teaches you that you're a sinner and you don't receive his word that you're a sinner, you can't get saved because you're rejecting his word to unbelief. You accept his word that you're a sinner and then you say, well, what do I do about my sins? 
he teaches that Jesus is the answer for your sin. You say, oh, I don't want to be in a Jesus freak. I don't want to do something like this. You can't get saved then. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes from the Father but by me. You know, so if you reject that Jesus is a solution to your sin, well, then uh, there's no way for you to get saved. And on like this, see, you've got to accept God's word as he teaches you and brings you that you're a sinner, that Jesus is the answer. You must humble yourself, like in Romans 10 says, uh, who serves call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But see, if you don't want to humble yourself and do that, that simple thing, you can't get saved. So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And then, for by grace are you saved through faith. When you humble yourself and call out to the Lord and ask his forgiveness of your sin, invite him to come into your heart and create in you the new heart, the new life. See, Jesus also says in John 6, 63, my words are spirit and they are life. Well, when his words come in you, then when you receive them in your heart, that spirit, the, the spirit of his words, you know, the living word in your heart then creates in you the new heart, the new life. That's a work of grace. So for by grace, the living work, you know, the work of the living spirit in your heart, you're saved by your faith, by your opening up your heart and receiving his words into your heart. So the grace, the work of the Spirit in you is a result of you humbling yourself, inviting him to come in. Okay, and then uh, that's so confused in our society. Say grace is God's unmerited favor. No, it's not. Grace unmerited favor is Romans chapter 2 verse 4 where it says he blesses lost people to draw them to repentance. See, lost people that are rejecting God and everything, uh, are running around sin, not even not seeking the Lord, just doing their own thing and everything. God blesses those people to draw them to repentance. If, if He doesn't beat people up to bring them to Him, now so many people get in such a hardship, you know, such a bad situation in their life, they call out to God for help. But it wasn't God that got them in that situation. God was blessing them all the time, trying to keep them out of that. But they were turning. And when they turn from God, see, when you, re when you reject anything of the Lord, you're giving Satan advantage in your life. And he comes in with the curses and everything. And that's what gets you down flat on your back and you can't do nothing. It wasn't God. But then when you call out to God and his mercy and everything, he forgives you, puts his spirit of you know, grace in you or his spirit of his living words in you. And then you come alive with him. Jesus said, my words are life and they're spirit. See, and that's where we receive the life of God, the Spirit of Christ in us. Well, it wasn't God that got you down in that situation, no. It's just that he helped you out of it. And so many people say, well, God did that to me, so I'd learn something. No, he didn't. He doesn't teach people by beating them up first and then, you know, telling them what to do. But you can learn a lot when you get yourself in a problem and you let the devil in, uh, ring you out or something like that, and then you turn to the Lord. As you're coming out of that, you can certainly learn a lot from God. But don't say God caused all that stuff for you to, to teach you something. No, he doesn't teach people that way. He teaches people with his love and everything. So God is grace is not God's unmerited favor. Favor has to do with his mercy on us and like this. Uh, blessing lost people to draw them to repentance. And uh, grace, though, is his loving spirit in our heart, creating the new heart to new life. And as we grow in with him, we receive more of his word as we study the scriptures and serve him and like that. We're growing in grace. So, uh, just so many things. Generational curses are being taught. Um, packages, church across town here. The Faith Church, the name of it. Okay, the last few years have sold packages of, you know, cassettes or DVDs, whatever like this. You know, uh, forty, fifty dollars, something like that, to get rid of general uh, generational curses. Well, if you read Ezekiel 18, you can get rid of them free because see, Ezekiel chapter 18, the whole chapter says there is no such thing as a generational curse today. God did away with those generational curses. Now, I'm going to come back and share with you a few more of these right after the break here. But I want you to go to my website and you know, as I said before, go there. And, and get some of these materials like this and start studying everything because we're all going to be responsible for God's pure word when we stand before the Lord. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. 
If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. podcast. Go to the World Wide Web at k98talk.com. Scroll down to podcasts. When podcast comes up, look for a red button with a white plus sign in it. Open this content in a new window by clicking the link. When a new website appears, click on Shows. Then scroll to God's Pure Word of Faith. Click on the name and a list of programs will come up. That's it. Now enjoy God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Here I've you know shared, let's see, about seventeen or eighteen programs on the air about uh, faith and grace. You know that I was just sharing before about how you receive you know the grace for salvation. There is something you must do about grace, and that's being taught across our society by the ministers. Said so there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do to earn it. There's you know it just God just in a sense dumps it on people that they get around to it and everything. But anyway. There is something you can do. You've got to receive his word that he speaks to you about being a sinner and that Jesus is the answer. You've got to receive those words to faith into your heart. You've got to accept them. If you reject them, it's unbelief and you can't get saved. But if you receive, yes, Lord, I'm a sinner. What do I do about my sin? And he teaches you, Jesus, you answer. And you say, yes, Lord, please forgive me. Say, Jesus, come into my heart and save me. See, you've got to respond positively to God's word for it to be faith. Now, through that faith, as he's teaching you that then, when his words come in you, they're alive. He and his word are the same. He comes into your heart then, creates in you the new heart, the new life. Like he's talked about, you know, in the, uh, Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart also will give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart, I give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you. See, his spirit's coming in us to live, and we're a child of God then. We're, it's it's more than just like the caterpillar turning into a beautiful butterfly. We go from just a creature of God with no spirit of God in us to a child of God. Man, that's great. 
or like the tadpole going to a frog. You know, those are big changes. You can see the physical changes in them, and, and they're so obvious. But you can't see that much physical change in us, so, but in our heart, it is completely changed. Creating a new heart, new creature. Second Corinthians 5. Uh, 20 says if any man be in Christ he is a new creature a new creature say we're we're different we're now children of God anyway but what's being taught in our society is so confusing everything like that like God hates Esau well one of the last programs uh, I've shared here is that God loved Esau and I showed from the scriptures that Esau's life was blessed all of his every day of his life it was blessed you know the man Esau it was five or six hundred years after Esau died that his uh, descendants, the Edomites, Esau and Edom, Esau's name was changed to Edom, so the Edomites, Esau's descendants, killed some of the children of Israel and brought God's curse on them. But it wasn't a man, Esau. Now, let's see. And uh, just so many things like his predestination to heaven or hell. I've shown in that too in that same message that God never predestined anyone to heaven or hell. He loves everybody. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ is being taught so much around our society that uh, that's where we're going to receive our crowns and you know wards and all this stuff. Yes, that scripture says that. But if you read the whole thing down there, it says, and that we're going to all answer for the good and the bad. Now, what would be the bad at the judgment seat of Christ? Because see, God's promised four or five times throughout the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, he'll forgive and forget our sins. So what is going to be bad at the judgment seat of Christ? Our unforgiven sins or sin activity, that is. The things that we've done that, you know, that keep us from being in God's perfect will. Like uh, the one holy calling I was mentioning earlier. He saved us, called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace created in Christ Jesus before the world began. It is terrible not to seek your holy calling. That's that's going to be there, the, the gifts and callings of the Lord are without repentance. Whether you repent and turn to it or not, you're going to have to answer when you stand before God. Because like it says in Second Chronicles 12, 14, not 7, 14 now, but Second Chronicles 12, 14, it says, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, did evil, because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. See, it's evil. And you say, in Second Chronicles 7, 14, it says, If my people call my name, humble themselves, and pray, and turn from their wicked ways or evil ways. Now, what's an evil way that we need to turn from? Well, one is being too lazy to seek his holy calling. See, because it says, you know, it's, a, it's an evil way that um, Rehoboam did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. So when you go stand before Christ someday, and, you know, a lot of you like me now, this is going to be pretty soon probably. But you're going to have to answer for seeking your holy calling and failing to seek it. See, there's things like that. Uh, failing to give anybody a, even a cup of water or something. Going visiting prisons, hospitals, something like this. And then in uh, 2 Corinthians 10, excuse me, 2 Corinthians, oh, I'm getting going here too fast. 2 Corinthians 2. Verses 10 and 11, it says, Forgive others lest you give Satan advantage. See, many Christians are dying today uh, giving Satan advantage in their life in so many areas because uh, you're holding unforgiveness against people. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 27, it says, Be angry, sin not, let not the sun go down your wrath. Well, see, that's giving Satan advantage. It says, Neither give place to the devil. See, you're giving place to the devil if you hold that anger and everything. And just on and on like this, you know. Husbands dwell with your wives according to knowledge, being joint heirs of grace life, as unto the weaker vessel, lest your prayers be hindered. You know, we're supposed to, like James 4, 7 says, submit to God. But when it says submit to God, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you've been, you're submitted to God. Submit to God means submit to His Word. Submit to His living Word daily. The just shall live by faith. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. See, a lot of people are Christians and just thinking because you've received Christ in your heart, that's all there is to it. It's not. You're supposed to be receiving and accepting God's word and serving him and, and, you know, sharing with others. We are supposed to be the priest in our neighborhood. We're supposed to be the priest of the people we meet. His priest on earth. Now, so uh, there's things we need to be doing here that we're going to have to answer for. And I don't know how, you know, at the judgment seat of Christ. And evaluating the good and the bad and everything, or what's going to happen to those that you know 
uh, haven't served or haven't sought him. And again, uh, what was it, Proverbs 1130, the fruit of the righteous tree of life, he that win a souls is wise. Have you led anybody to the Lord? Have, have you been the witness to them and shared with them and prayed with them? Now, I know you, you, know, you don't get an opportunity to pray with everybody you share with and everything like that. But I tell you what, if you haven't received the joy of praying with people and them receiving Christ in their heart, Christ, the living word, into their heart and, and getting a new life and everything and seeing a joy on their face and hearing them say, oh, such a burden has been lifted and, and things like this. If you haven't received that joy, you know, you need to start seeking, like says, he that wins souls, why start praying and seeking in the scriptures and learning about salvation, learning about telling people, you know, how to, you know, they got to turn to the Lord and ask him to forgive them of their sins and receive the spirit of Christ. Jesus, I'm the way, the truth, and the life into their heart, you know, like this, and get that joy of seeing changed lives. If you haven't done that, that needs to be the top of your priority. Get your own salvation worked out that you know for sure that you, the Spirit of Christ lives in your heart and you've got a changed heart. Then start sharing that joy with others. Because if you haven't, you know, all this lifetime here on earth, and when you stand before the Lord, you know, we're all going to wish we had done so much more. It, it, to see his magnificent, you know, magnificence and, you know, just and the power that's available to us and things like this that we can't seem to understand here. But we're going to say, oh, Lord, if I could just do some more, if I could do it over. But, you know, we've got to seek him and do it here this time. But now there's so much division, even about the Trinity. I had a message uh, recently on one of my podcasts about the Trinity. The Trinity is so simple. It's compared to Joseph and the Pharaoh in Egypt, how Pharaoh exalted Joseph to the second highest position in the land, gave him all power and authority under him. And then Joseph, he said, everybody will live by your word. Well, that's what God has done with Jesus. He's exalted Jesus, except not to the second highest position. God has exalted Jesus to the fullness of Godhead bodily in Philippians chapter 2, to the fullness of God. And he is the speaker today. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 says that in times past God spoke through the prophets and like this, but says now it's it's Jesus that's doing the speaking to us and his living word Christ in comes to us. So see, study those uh, chapters about Joseph, the Pharaoh, and Egypt and everything in Genesis, about the last 10 chapters from Genesis 40 to 50, and then get that physical trinity there working in your mind and then look at what God has done with Jesus, exalting him to the fullness of Godhead bodily, the man Jesus. And now Jesus rules by his word. And God just kind of sits back and lets him do it. He was so pleased with Jesus, he just turned the operation over to him. But it doesn't mean he's, you know, not still God and everything, but it's, uh, anyway, the Trinity. But study that. Oh, just so many things here. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. And then stop there. No, all things work together for good for those that call according to God's purpose. See, that holy calling and everything, you're seeking that holy calling like that, and God's going to do it. I've heard so many people say, well, all things work together for good, and they do not. All things do not. If everything worked together for good, nobody would go to hell. And... And you could see from the scriptures throughout, there's going to be a lot of people rejecting the Lord's going to hell. <coughs> Excuse me. In Matthew chapter 7, in fact, a lot of people think they're Christians are going to go to hell. I've, I've heard a minister one day um, walking to church, and one of the first things he said, Welcome, Mary. We're all believers. We're all going to be there someday. You know, just being a believer, it does say in places, you know, just, um, you know, Believers, you know, going to heaven and this and like that. Yes, believers will go to heaven if they respond correctly. When we come to a knowledge of Jesus, knowledge of God and everything, just believing is not going to be your final answer to get you to heaven. In James chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Devils believe and tremble. You know, so what's going to be the difference between you believing and them believing? When Jesus came in the presence of the demons, the demons cried out, Jesus, thou son of the most high God, why do you torment us for our time? See, they knew who Jesus was. They believed. They knew who he was. They confessed who he was. Jesus, thou son of the most high God, why do you torment us before our time? They knew their time's coming, but they knew it hadn't come yet. See, they were believers. 
they ain't gonna be in heaven though and there's a lot of believers uh, running around today knowing that God's real knowing that you know Jesus is died on the cross and believing that he's God's son but it says in second second Thessalonians 2 10 11 says that people perish because they reject the love of the truth just getting that intellectual knowledge and believing and knowing it's from God in your head you got to respond to receive the love of the truth to receive the living word of that truth into your heart see that's a big difference that's like your mom tell you, you know, eat that spinach, it's good for you. Now, you you know your mother wants what's best for you and everything. You know what she said's true, the intellectual and everything like that. But do you just, you know, eat that spinach up then, just enjoy it, it's so great, receiving it in your your stomach and everything like that? No. You might do it begrudgingly and everything just because you want to please your mom or, you know, do it while she's there or something like that. But see, that, but rejecting it, see, now, see, a lot of people... Are rejecting God's word like that. You have it in your head. But you say, well, I want to wait till I get through some of my wild oats. I want to wait till I get out of college. I want to wait till I get married. I want to wait till I get my life straightened up. And all these kind of things. The devil's got you waiting. And he, he, once a person starts waiting, it is so difficult to ever then get that person to stop and surrender their heart and life to the Lord because the devil will have them find some other excuse, some other reason. But see, it just so many things like this being taught wrong just because a person believes and knows you got to come to that but if you reject you're an unbelief because those are the people it doesn't say in the scripture anywhere that I can find that doubters are going to hell see God has promised to bring everybody to a knowledge of their sin Jesus answer grace of God that bring a salvation appeared to all men it says in Titus like that and it says in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 Apostle Paul says that the heavens declare the glory of God. and says, we're all without excuse. You know, like that. So if we're out excuse, that means everybody's going to be a believer. In fact, everybody in hell and lake of fire are going to be believers because God will have brought them to a knowledge of him and his love, and they had to reject it, become an unbeliever. That's what unbelief is, is rejecting the belief that you know about God. So everybody in hell is going to be a believer. They just will have rejected what they believed and refused to you know, obey what they knew to do. That's sad. And there's going to be a lot of, I tell you what, the instant a lot of people die, their theology just really changes everything. But we're supposed to be here sharing with people and encouraging them to make that choice now. And there's so many errors being taught in our scriptures. Like, uh, about healing, twenty no fourteen times in the New Testament it says that Jesus healed all the people. Let's see what is it? Uh, Matthew uh, chapter nine, verse thirty-five, where he says that, uh, and Jesus went throughout all the villages, all the cities, preaching the gospel, casting out evil spirits, and healing all manner of sicknesses and diseases. And that's just one of those 14 times it says that. Now, some of them are repeated in Mark, three or four of them. So uh, it's not completely 14 different, you know, circumstances. But uh, look at all the people Jesus healed like that. And not one of them, it wasn't God's will for even one of those people to be sick. Because, see, if any of those people, all those multitudes that Jesus healed, if any of them, had their sickness because God gave it to them to teach them something, or for, oh, this is good, you know, to teach them something and to make them grow strong. You know, my sickness made me grow strong. You know, that God gave it to me. No, no. If God had given sicknesses to any of those people, Jesus would have been sinning by, you know, violating His Father's will for that person or something. See, so it was God's will for all of them to be healed that Jesus healed because Jesus says, "I only do what my Father says to me to do, and I only say what He says me to do." Say. See, so he would have been sinning if any of those sick people he healed had have been sick because God had put it on them. So see, that's not true. God doesn't do that. In, in Jeremiah it says, God's thoughts for us are, you know, to prosper. For His thoughts for us are to, you know, be in health and everything, to be a testimony for him. And like in, uh, well, we're supposed to be that testimony of how God treats his people so lovingly that they will want it. Like Psalm 67 David says, God be merciful and bless us, cause his face to shine upon us, 
that your way may be known on earth, your saving health among all the nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth, you know, uh, well, I forgot what it says there. But then let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield forth its uh, fruits, and God, even God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. And I like to add to it, and hopefully know his love and his presence. But it says that they'll all fear him because it's just such a blessing to the children of Israel. But see, God blesses people not to just bless me or to bless you or something like that. He wants those blessings to overflow to others. He don't want just give us enough that we're blessed and that's it. He wants the blessings that he shares with us to be obvious to others. He wants the blessings to be that overflowing to others. See, he wants us to be his examples, his testimony, his Second uh, Corinthians 5, um, 19, 20, along there, it says we're to be ambassadors for him, to carry his word. But it says it's got to be his pure word or he won't back it up. God only backs up his pure word. And again, in Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6, every word of God is pure, a shield those who put their trust in him. Don't add to, lest thou be reproved and made a liar. And the evidence of that is that when you say something's God's word, God's will, and he doesn't back it up, see, you've added to it or something, taken away from it, changed it, something. And we're supposed to be ambassadors to share the testimonies. And the testimony is so important. What is it? Revelation twelve eleven. They overcame him, speaking of the devil. They overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb, see, and Jesus has already done that, and by the word of their testimony. See, us sharing what Christ has done in us, Christ, the living word, has done in us when he come into our heart, created us a new heart to new life and we become a child of God and sharing that joy with others that's what we should be happening in our society and if you don't have that joy of and everything like that if you're not sure the spirit of Christ has come to live in your heart all it takes is just an open honest prayer it, it doesn't have to be theological and everything like that a drunk well I used to say you know down on skid row laying in the gutter or something like that if his heart if he said oh God help that's all it takes. Second Corinthians chapter three verse sixteen says, "When the heart of man turns to the Lord, the veil of separation is lifted." When the heart of man turns, see that veil of separation is referring to. There used to be a veil for the holy of holies in the Old Testament temple that nobody could go in there but the priest once a year, and that was where God resided. And if a priest even went in there with sin, God would strike him down dead. They had a rope on his foot to pull him back out dead if he died. But see, he wasn't supposed to go into holy holies with any sin. The priest was supposed to go through all of his sacrifices and get himself uh, forgiven and straightened up before he went in for the sins of the congregation and everything. But see, that veil of separation, though, you had to be holy <laughs> and forgiven to get in there. Well, in Second Corinthians what is it, 3.16, when the heart of man turns to the Lord, that veil of separation is lifted, you can enter right into God's presence, and he'll, you know, and he hears heart language. So it doesn't have to be exact words. If you have a heart, if you want, God, some people have come to me through the years, as a, uh, I don't know exactly the verse now, but in about chapter 4, 5, 6, somewhere along in there in Hebrews, it says, you know, that um, if you've known God, you know, God brought his will to you, and visit you and everything and you've turned from him, you know it's impossible if you ever come again and some people come to me and said well you know I can't get saved again you know I've done these bad things I've done all this stuff and everything like that and it says you you know you can never again return and I said but it or bring the repentance I said but yet if you want to see that verse is not talking about you I'm not sure completely myself what all that verse means but anybody that has a heart that wants to turn to God that verse is not talking to them that says, you know, it's impossible to renew them to repentance. Because, see, if, if you're repenting and wanting to turn, it can't be talking about you. So anybody listening right now, you can turn to the Lord right now, get your sins forgiven, enter into the Holy of Holies, and He'll put the Spirit of Christ in your heart, creating you the new heart and the new life. You'll be a child of God. And He forgives and forgets our sins. Well, and he gives you a, a new clean heart to start it with. Like uh, I repeat so many times, but that's such a, a, a 
beautiful definition or description of grace in Ezekiel 36 26 a new heart also will I give you a new spirit will I put within you I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh and I'll put my spirit in you see he's going to take away that stony heart filled with sins and everything like that and he's going to create in you the new heart the new life see we all start into the kingdom of God we're all baptized by the spirit washed and cleansed our heart you know the spiritual baptizing, baptizing cleansing our heart what is it Romans 12:13 uh, it says uh, we're all baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ see the baptism of cleansing the Old Testament people had to be baptized by water and cleansed to become a Jew and that's the purpose of you know but now as we're baptized cleansed new heart a new life and then God himself dwells in us in he said I'll put my spirit in you he dwells in us we're his children when that happens it'll be so different in your life you'll you know tell others let other people know just what God has done for you and everything I can remember the changes took place in my heart and life and I'd been in church 20 something years thinking I was a Christian but when those changes started taking place in my life I, oh my goodness how could I have missed this all those years all those sermons I heard all those times you know just how could anybody be so blind as, as to miss it but I did but well, I'm so glad now to receive the Spirit of Christ in my heart, become a child of God, and and can sit here with all confidence, knowing that man, if I died right this instant, I'd just be going to be with the Lord. Cause see, Jesus took our sin, our separation from God, and we will never be separated again. Our eternal life as Christians has started when we received Christ in our heart. My eternal life started 40 something years ago, and when I leave this physical body now, this could be straight to go be with the Lord. All it takes is just a simple prayer now. You don't have to say these exact words, but just, Jesus, I ask you, please, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all my sins. Cleanse my heart of my sin. I want to turn from my sin. I surrender my heart and life to you and invite your spirit to come into my heart. Christ, to create in me a new, clean heart and to come in and live in my heart. In your name, Jesus, I ask, amen. I see, that's a lot of words there. You remember more of them like yeah. Just like I said a while ago, you can your heart and just cry out, help, and God will hear an answer. Because he hears and answers heart language. But just ask forgiveness of your sins. Invite him to come into your heart. Welcome him in. He won't come in uninvited now, you know. So your heart's got to be open to him to come in. Receptive and everything. And you'll never regret it. This will be the greatest day in your life. And then you need to be out sharing with others and getting the joy to see other people's hearts and lives change as a result of what you're doing. And the joy of God working with you and confirming the word. He confirms the word, words of his counselors. So when we're out counseling people for the Lord and everything, sharing with him, hopefully we're sharing with him his pure word, you know, being a good testimony and everything like that. And then when they respond and receive Christ in their heart, you know, to see the joy that God was there working with you, you know, that God was speaking to their heart as you were speaking to their head. And when they responded in, their lives changed and see the blessings they received. Now that's, that's a joy that you can't get anywhere else. Walk, working with the Lord and you know, sharing with Him and fellowshipping with Him. Well, I think I just got started on a message I wanted to share with you today. So Friday morning, if you'll join back with me, I'm going to continue this message and, until I get completely through with it because of not going to be in a hurry to get finished with it and I'm just going to keep sharing until I get it all covered I want to share with you because God loves you and he loves me and he wants us to grow together in the unity of that one spirit the one spirit of faith the one belief in unity Christ in us our hope of glory God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. 
That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books.